Remember the Arizona Texans jokes? Well, how does the Houston Cardinals sound? Texans hire Arizona defensive line coach Matt Burke as their defensive coordinator. Also, Cliff Kingsbury to Houston. Does that confirm Houston selecting the quarterback with the second overall pick? Plus, we are joined by Brandon K. Scott here on today's episode of the Locked On Texans. When it came down to it, there is no place I wanted to be any more than H-Town. So it was an easy, it was an easy pick for me. It was a no-brainer to be here. All right, be home. It was a no-brainer. So it wasn't a, a difficult decision at all. It was very- you are locked on Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome in, everybody, to a Saturday episode of the Locked On Texas Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On NFL. I'm John Hickman. Of course, I'm joined by Cody Davis. Made that joke to start off the show. Houston uh, uh, Cardinals. Uh, Arizona mm. Texans. I don't know where we're going right now, but we will talk about the defensive line coach, Matt Burke, being hired as the Houston Texans' next defensive coordinator. That slot has been filled. However, on Friday, what a busy day for Houston. Wait until the weekend to get busy. Former, former Arizona Cardinals coach Cliff Kingsbury returned from his one-way trip from Thailand to interview for the Texans' vacancy which before Friday, offensive coordinator vacancy, excuse me, before Friday morning, it seemed to have Bobby Slowick as the lock-in for that position. Just a quick update on Cliff Kingsbury to let you guys know about his resume. In four years, Kingsbury had a 28-37-1 record. The Cardinals' best offensive year was in 2021 when they were number eight in yards and number 11 in points per game. The 2020 team was number six in yards and number 13 in points per game. And that team averaged 122 rushing yards per game that season, which ranked them 10th in the NFL. If this deal goes through, Cody, and Kingsbury is named the Texans' next head, I mean, not head coach, thank God, but the Texans' next offensive coordinator, I got a couple of thoughts. Number one, unlike how I felt about the defensive coordinator position since the hiring of D'Amico Ryans, whoever the OC is will have the majority say in designing concepts in game day play calling compared to the defensive coordinator, which will now be Matt Burke, where I still feel like D'Amico Ryans will be more than heavily involved and will still call plays on game day. Um, And whether or not it's Cliff Kingsbury or anybody, but specifically, Specifically, Cliff Kingsbury, he won't have to worry about time management as an OC, something that he struggled with in his days in Arizona as the head coach, and he won't have to deal with the diva antics of a Kyler Murray. Uh, what I'm getting at is if, King's King, if Cliff Kingsbury is hired and just has to focus on play calling and putting together an offense, this might not be a bad idea. And I want to continue with by saying I will go as far as to say this may be a good idea and a, an ideal you should strongly consider. And I don't know what's going on at number two, but if you bring in Cliff Kingsbury, Bryce Young, maybe CJ Stroud, a new quarterback will be in town. Um, surprisingly, John, I am on the fence with this one. Um, I've always been on the fence about Cliff Kingsbury. But at the same time, I do understand, to me at least, and I agree to your point, this might be a sign that the Houston Texans are definitely considering um, taking a quarterback at number two. I'm going to take it a little bit further and say that if they hire Cliff Kingsbury as their new offensive coordinator, it seems like that Bryce Young might be the might be the pick at number two only because when you take a look at Kingsbury's track record, regardless of what you have to say about his record, regardless what you have to say about his time coaching Patrick Mahomes at Texas tech. And I know that's a whole nother different type of subject, but you, what you cannot take away is his impressive track record of 
coaching and finding success with quarterbacks who are undersized. And when you take a look at Bryce Young, what is Bryce Young, an undersized quarterback? As a matter of fact, um, you know, just off the top of my head, I, I, I might be wrong in this standpoint, but isn't he and Kyler Murray around the same size? Kyler Murray is what, 5'10", 5'11". Um, Bryce Young is measured as six foot. Don't know how true that is. But, you know, you take a look at both of those guys. However, what I would say is um, when you take a look at Kyler Murray, he is more so of the dual threat quarterback, which, you know, Bryce Young could use his legs. But, however, he's a little bit more of your pocket presence quarterback that you would like to see so you know to me I think this is just the Houston Texans saying you know what we would like to get Bryce Young at number two this is a guy you mentioned Johnny Mazel you know I understand what his career ended up being but you know I hate to say it but he was that guy Texas a and at one time and and, and Cliff King's pair Cliff Kingsbury played a huge role in his success. However, if I had to choose, John, you know me. I love to see a coach do more with less. I'm still rooting for Bobby to get the job. Once again, you saw what he was able to do with Brock. Uh, once again, a source told me majority of the sets that we saw San Francisco have with Brock came due to Bobby. And once again, if I'm looking at a, at a coach, I want to see what they can do with less before you give them a quote-unquote generational talent like Bryce Young. You also got to keep in mind, it's still a small chance that Davis Mills still might be the team quarterback moving forward. And if that is the case, no, 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 no. If that is the case, you heard, you, you, you heard what Ryan, what, what, what D'Amico Ryan said about a week ago in his press conference. He did not confirm, nor, he, nor did he not deny but if that is the case, I would much rather see somebody like Bobby who, once again, could do more with less. I will say this. Cliff Kingsbury did offer Bryce Young a scholarship in the eighth grade. Eighth um, grade. <laughs> but the you know the best version of Cliff Kingsbury that I think we've seen so far has been with Patrick Mahomes. I don't think because of his, his track record mm, with Bryce Young. I wouldn't Young, necessarily say that. I, don't, that I mean, no, don't get me wrong. Patrick Mahomes was like, you know, good at Texas, but he wasn't like this version that's about to submit a resume for a GOAT six, seven years into his career. There's only one person that saw that before coming out, and that's my good friend, uh, Corey White. But I, I do want to say that just because his track record with shorter quarterbacks shows that he can be successful with those quarterbacks doesn't mean – that he wants to, or the team should, and the idea should be, let's get you that quarterback that you've been ideally working with. I can't wait to the pro days for these quarterbacks hmm. because we shouldn't limit what he can and cannot do because of the ideal of what he did with Kyler Murray. And I will go as far as saying that Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray hindered the success that that, possibly, that team could have possibly had because of uh, some of the physical attributes that he has. And I also believe that he's a diva. Once he got his contract, we heard about the, you know, uh, watch film clause. I thought that was crazy to hear. Um, he won't have to worry about that. I only have to worry about play calling and, and designing an offense that will help this team go. But I wouldn't rule out CJ Stroud. And before moving on, since we're talking about the possibility of Cliff Kingsbury becoming this team offensive coordinator, I want to just replay this again. Here is the idea of what D'Amico Ryans would like to do with his offense. All right. We're still going through that process. We want to find the best staff, right, that complements each other and the best staff to support our players. So we're still going through that process. How I envision the offense looking, right, we want to play with precision. We want to play with effort. We want to play with physicality. So with that being, we want to own the line of scrimmage. We want to establish the run game first, but we want to be balanced. Right? We want to be able to operate with play action pass. Right? We also want to be efficient. We want to have explosive playmakers who we can get the ball to. If, if it's not down the field, we want to be able to throw as you see, throw a check down right? and put it in the hands of an explosive playmaker and see him create. So they're – Everything about our offense, we want to make sure that we're adaptable to the players that we have, making sure we're playing to the strengths of our players, getting the ball in our playmaker's hand and letting them make play. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. 
I want to shout out to my teammates at work. Because of my teammates, my job is super easy. And I tell you what, I've heard my supervisors say, thank God for LinkedIn. LinkedIn is what got me to where I am today. And this is the reason why you need to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experience to help you achieve your goals at your job. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly prioritize candidates to your uh, open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your job posts in front of the most qualified candidates. Uh, that's why uh, small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this latest installment of Locked On Texans. And you guys already know the drill. Brandon K. Scott from Source Radio 610. Brandon, what's good, man? Man, it's, it's, everything is good right now. You know, got a staff <laughs> developing with the Texans, and we're just a few days ahead of the Super Bowl. So uh, this is a good time of the week for me, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You already mentioned it. D'Amico Ryan, he is slowly... But surely it's starting to put together a staff on yesterday. We got the news that D'Amico Ryan's hired Matt Burke as his new defensive coordinator. And also a surprising turn of events, Cliff Kingsbury is getting looked at as a potential for the offensive coordinator. Uh, B. Scott, let's jump right into it. First and foremost, and I know Matt Burke is already, you know, solidified, but we got to start with the biggest news. What are your thoughts about Cliff Kingsbury becoming or the potential of Cliff Kingsbury becoming the new offensive coordinator for the Houston Texans? Well, it's a surprise little curveball because it seems like for about a week now, the it was well, not exactly a week, but close to a week now, you would say that the offensive coordinator candidates have been narrowed down. Like you mm -hmm. hadn't heard of a new interview for again for about a week you know like i think the leader in the clubhouse if you would or the favorite was bobby slowick the mm -hmm. uh, the the passing game coordinator for the san francisco 49ers and of course they had also interviewed troy walters the wide receivers coach from the cincinnati Bengals, and gerard johnson from the minnesota vikings he had been the assistant quarterbacks coach there and so there's a feeling it, you know that they interviewed these three candidates one of them seemed to have the closest connection to Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, that is, being Bobby Slowick, the San Francisco 49ers passing game coordinator that seemed like a natural fit for D'Amico Ryans, and we hadn't really heard much or anything since then, so it seemed like, okay, well, no news was maybe good news, and maybe they were narrowing down the details, and then lo and behold, on <laughs> Friday, call it a Friday <laughs> news dump if you want, but of course, you know, Matt Burke is – revealed as for sure going to be the defensive coordinator which was not really a big thing for a lot of people considering that D'Amico Ryans is a defensive minded head coach he's coming mm -hmm. in as the AP assistant coach of the year uh they had just been given that award the day before by NFL honors so you're feeling like okay we're the Texans are hiring the best defensive assistant for sure best assistant mm -hmm. period and certainly the best defensive assistant that you could ask for in D'Amico Ryans so that part is cool what are they going to do at offensive coordinator? What's taking so long with all of these names over the past week? And then you get the curveball of Cliff Kingsbury, which makes it really interesting. Cliff Kingsbury has a polarizing sort of reputation because it has not worked out with him as a head coach. No one would mistake him to be a good head coach in either of his high pro profile runs in with Texas Tech or with the Arizona Cardinals. But there's a reason why he's been respected as an offensive coordinator at various places, whether it had been Texas A&M with Johnny Manziel or at U of H with Case Keenum uh, or, or the reason why they wanted him at USC before he ditched them to go to the Arizona Cardinals. Like there's always been this feeling and this idea that Cliff, that Cliff Kingsbury coming up under Mike Leach, Mike Leach obviously played under Mike Leach in the air raid was sort of this offensive 
you know, uh, uh, asset that 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 would be good to have on any staff. So, you know, what if it's the case that Cliff Kingsbury's ceiling right now is offensive coordinator, or what if he just needs another run at offensive coordinator before he goes back to be a head coach? Because you figure a guy that young that gets a head coaching job, that's something that he's looking to do again, or you would mm-hmm. imagine. So, so yeah, man, it's a it's an interesting plot twist, uh, both <laughs> both in terms of the football element of it the storyline element of it, because everything that we'd heard about Cliff Kingsbury is that he had left for Thailand and wasn't looking back, right? <laughs> yes, that was sir. the story. Yeah. The end of hard knocks and what everybody been talking about, what all the jokes have been about since the end of the season was that he took that one-way ticket to Thailand and ain't nobody heard from him since. And then all of a sudden, here he reemerges in Houston as a possibility for D'Amico Ryan's staff. So I'm very intrigued by all of it and, and certainly would be interested to see what it would look like if he were, in fact, hired. Brandon, I do want to pick your brain about this because this is something John and myself played around in the first segment with. Um, when you take a look at Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury, I'm always looking at trends and stuff, see if I could like try to put puzzles together and everything. I'm pretty sure you've already known that. Um, if the Houston Texans go this route of hiring Cliff Kingsbury as their new offensive coordinator, um, is there, I guess, more belief to the fact that Bryce Young is more of a possibility to get drafted by the Houston Texans at number two. And of course, I only say that because you take a look at the track record that Cliff Kingsbury has um, coaching some undersized quarterback. Of course, the biggest one of all is um, Kyler Murray during his time in Arizona. Yeah, it's something that you definitely have to look at. And Kyler Murray at Arizona is the most obvious and recent example, but I will point again to Johnny Manziel mm-hmm. at, at Texas. Which I didn't, I didn't, it was a reason why I didn't want to look too much into Johnny, but I, no, I get your but, point. But, but, but Cliff's time with Johnny is something to look at. Like John, mm-hmm. Johnny himself in a vacuum is not something that you want to make a comparison to, but Cliff's time with Johnny is the best that we've seen Johnny look. Mm-hmm. So from that standpoint, I think it would be – sort of a, a positive or clearly a positive for Cliff Kingsbury, just a, another mark on his re- matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's something that he would have to tout and mention when he goes on an interview was like, mm-hmm. look, there's something to this thing with me being a coach because I made Johnny Manziel look like this, or, you know, oh, I yeah. coached Johnny I Manziel when he won the Heisman trophy and ain't looked like that since, since then. So there, I think there's something to that. Um, obviously, you know, the, the Bryce Young thing is, is, is something that's there anyway. I honestly, I've thought that even since D'Amico was hired and just the, the idea that it wouldn't be like the fear, the only fear for me with whether, and I'm somebody just, let's just be clear and kind of open here. I'm somebody that's in support of them drafting Bryce Young. And so the only thing that I was worried about and them not being interested in that was Nick Casario. And and, mm-hmm. and to be clear, I don't even know for sure that Nick Casario wouldn't be open to it. You just feel like his success, the majority of his success has had come with Tom Brady. The guy that he drafted, his first draft pick with the Texans was, you know, was Davis Mills. And so the idea with that is, OK, maybe Nick Casario has a type when it comes to quarterback. And so when they hired D'Amico Ryans, I always thought that. You know they they're gonna look for somebody that number one is you know can do the basic quarterback things in terms of decision making and processing and 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 accuracy but not too far behind that they're gonna want somebody that's mobile and that can move around in a system like that and i figured that that made it in play like if you and if you're gonna draft bryce young that's the type of system that you're probably going to want to have because a guy that's that small you want to you're going to want to get him on the move as much as possible even though even though okay bryce young is an excellent pocket passer quarterback prospect Hmm. and so uh and so i i've always thought that you know the the, ever since they hired D'Amico, that that was a possibility And, and certainly cliff's success with smaller quarterbacks makes you uh, gives you a little bit more of an idea or a little bit of uh, a, a sense for what that what that offensive room and what those uh, what those minds are going to think of a quarterback prospect when they come together. Before moving on, um, I do, of course, want to get your thoughts about the hiring of Matt, of Matt Burks. Um, John doesn't like the hiring. 
I'm not really looking too much into it because we all know what type of defensive minded juggernaut um D'Amico Ryan's is. You mentioned it early on in the show. But what are your thoughts about Matt coming to H Town? I think it's interesting. I don't really have much thought on it in terms of him being the defensive coordinator specifically. And I know that's obviously what he's being hired for. Of course, D'Amico Ryan's, as we've mentioned, and as everyone knows, is a defensive coach. So I feel like it's kind of a wash there. I like the 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 actual co- head coach hire of D'Amico Ryan's as defensive coach, and so that that cancels cancels out any concern that I might have about Matt Burke as defensive coordinator. But I do I do point specifically to his time with the Jets in 2021 as game management coach, mm-hmm. and I didn't watch enough Jets football, or at least didn't watch it closely enough to be too critical one way or the other of what the game management coach did or was or how good he was at that. But I I, I do find it interesting when you talk about connecting dots. Okay. As we were saying earlier with Cliff and, and and might they want Cliff Kingsbury to coach a small quarterback, the, 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 the game management coordinator for Robert Sala in his first year with the New York jets is now going to be the defensive coordinator for D'Amico Ryans in his first year as the head coach for the Houston Texans. And so what that leads me to believe is that between the two of them, they'll have the defensive side figured out. And possibly this is someone that helps him with game management. You know, that that is somebody that D'Amico Ryans is able to lean on and confide in when it comes to game management, even if he doesn't have that specific title. Like you look, look on the sidelines the last couple of years with David Culley and Lovey Smith, the the person that seemed like they might be the game management coordinator or somebody that definitely seems to have some game management input during the game is Frank Ross, who, who they're also going, going to retain, the special teams coordinator. But he's mm-hmm. somebody that seems like he's had sort of a voice and, and been really active in in-game decisions and moments whenever just from observing from the sideline without really knowing that for sure. And so I picture that being – Matt Burke in this in a similar role because he did it for Robert Sala, who was obviously D'Amico Ryan's his predecessor in uh, in San Francisco. So there the, there's the connection there. Like if you're making the connection uh, to to D'Amico Ryan's, it is him being the 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 game management coordinator or the game management coach for the guy whose job that he replaced last. So that 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 to me makes sense, and we'll see how it plays out. Don't really have much thoughts on him as a defensive coordinator. I know that he had some experiences. One is Miami's defensive coordinator about five years ago. Um, if if you go back and look at how that defense performed that year, there is no metric that or those two years. There's no metric that says this was a good defense or that this was a good defensive coordinator. And so hopefully, again, like I said, D'Amico Ryan's being the coach that he is sort of cancels that out and maybe more of the contribution from Burke is helping D'Amico with some of the game management stuff. We are really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you are new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. The two things you're looking for. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet, which means you'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score the first touchdown. The FanDuel sports back Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you get your pay winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this weekend installment of Locked On Texans. And I know this is Locked On Texans. And hopefully, prayfully, Within the next 10 years, we will finally have an opportunity to truly talk about the Super Bowl here on this podcast because maybe D'Amico Ryan, CJ, Bryce, John, Mitchie, or whoever else you want to name will finally lead this team to the big game on Sunday 
But unfortunately, we're going to take a little detour and talk about this year's Super Bowl and give our thoughts and our predictions on it. As everybody knows, Eagle versus Chiefs. B. Scott, before I go into predictions, I think this is a realistic conversation people need to start having now. And that is the GOAT talk surrounding or the potential GOAT talk surrounding Patrick Mahomes. I'm under the belief, of course, that Tom Brady is the greatest of all times. I don't really know who you consider the GOAT. Uh, I would guess Tom Brady is that true or, you know, so. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, I think, yeah. I think yeah, if you I, take. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think the results speak for themselves. It's, it's hard to argue with seven Super Bowls, even if you want to be cute about it. Um, I, I think it's, it's kind of hard to argue with that. Yeah. I, and, you know, and the reason why I say it's really time for us to start talking about this, because early on in the week, you know, LeBron James broke the NBA scoring record. And, you know, even way back then, you always knew, OK, there's a possibility he could have a resume for the GOAT. And now it's like, damn, it's to the point he's almost undeniable at this point. Yeah. But. I think this is this that statement is going to be more true if Patrick Mahomes went on Sunday only because and I'm not saying he's the GOAT already, but I'm saying that he's going to have a very interesting case to be the GOAT because the three quarterbacks I think we all consider GOATs, Tom Brady, Joe Montana, and and, and Peyton Manning. If Patrick Mahomes wins the Super Bowl on Sunday, he will be the Youngest quarterback to have multiple Super Bowls and multiple league MVPs. And it only took him about six years. Tom Brady took him 11. Joe Montana took him 12. And unfortunately, it took Peyton Manning about 17, 18 years. But when you take a look at that, man, <laughs> and you take a look at what Patrick Mahomes has been doing, like, is it too early to say that he needs to enter his name into this GOAT talk? I'm just saying if we're keeping it a buck. <laughs> Yeah, so it, I guess it's, it would only be early if you concede that Tom Brady, a lot of the reason why Tom Brady is the GOAT is because he won early and he won late, mm -hmm. and he's got the longevity of 20 years, 20-plus years or whatever it is. And so, you know, and then sandwiched in between all of that is actually his greatest individual success. Mm -hmm. So so Tom Brady's career is he, he's obviously the GOAT, but then has a very interesting career arc because he wins early before he's really that good. And then he gets to be that good, but they're not winning, at least not winning the Super Bowl. They're still competitive, obviously, mm -hmm. like they were never really bad with Tom Brady. But then there's that nine-year stretch that they go after they win the first three. They go that nine-year stretch without winning the Super Bowl at all. And then they win the next three, you know, three in the four years or whatever it was, you know. And so he goes on these two different incredible runs of Super Bowls. But in between that, when they weren't winning it, right, when they were going but losing to the Giants and that sort of thing, that's when he actually became – sort of this individual type of goat who happened to also have the team success prior to and then accumulated the team success after that and was able to maintain a certain level of play even as he aged, right? Tom Brady has aged as a quarterback better than anybody in, in NFL history, obviously. So it's a, it's a very interesting kind of an impressive story of both individual excellence but also longevity, right? So it's something that's going to be hard to argue with, but the but the thing, the thing about Patrick Mahomes and and I think that it's going to be very easy to have a goat conversation about him very soon. Only I think he only has to win a couple of more, honestly, Cody. Like once you win, once you win three Super Bowls, you're already kind of in a in a, in a in a certain pantheon to begin with. But the thing that I would say about Patrick Mahomes that I think is also undeniable is that he has had the most impressive individual sort of start to a career right mm -hmm. like tom brady had won a couple of super bowls maybe by now but in terms of like no one would no one would confuse early tom brady with what we see from patrick mahomes right with mm -hmm. early patrick mahomes like you're having a conversation again about tom brady because of the longevity but patrick mahomes has had the most impressive you know first one, two, three, four, five. This is five years as a starter. He's had the most impressive five to six years start to a career that we've ever seen. 
hmm. ever, you know. And so it stands to reason that if the person who's had the most impressive first five years as a, as a starter that you've ever seen, if he maintains that level of play over a certain amount of time, let's say another three to five years, then yeah, he's going to be the GOAT. And I don't <laughs> I don't think he has to win seven Super Bowls to be the GOAT. I just think he has to maintain this just for a little while longer, you know, just for about three to four to five more years. And it's going to be pretty clear. Now, the one thing that I don't think is deniable is, again, what I just said, the best start individual start for a quarterback that we've ever seen. And then the talent, like if you're just doing an eye test, drop somebody in and erase their knowledge of NFL history, but keep their knowledge of football. Right. They let, let them still know what they're looking at. But take away the information of, hey, Tom Brady won seven Super Bowls and Joe Montana won, you know, and all of that. Take away all of that information and just say, who the best? Look at this. Look at that. Look at this. Look at that. And you show Patrick Mahomes among the rest of them. And it's going to be very clear. And I don't (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. I don't even think at this point it's going to be even be controversial. Like, I don't know how many times you got to go out there and watch him or sit at your house or wherever it is and watch him and be sold on this idea. like. Patrick Mahomes is clearly on a track to becoming the greatest of all time very soon. You know, with everything that you just say, it reminds me of conversation people were having about Jordan versus LeBron about 10 years ago, right? Before he won his first championship, they were saying he doesn't have to win six championships to be the GOAT. You know, you just have to sustain this longevity. And we see he's done that now 10 years later. Um, uh, Like I say, I'm not saying Patrick Mahomes is the GOAT right now. I just think when you're looking at somebody's resume five, six years into their careers, it's like, okay, he's already building a resume. But on the opposite side of the line of scrimmage, we have um, the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I think think it's fair to say a lot of people in the city of Houston will be rooting for Philly because of that other quarterback that's on the other side of the line of scrimmage, um, Jalen Hurts. I've always been a Jalen Hurts fan, and I love the fact that he had proven so many of his doubters wrong. B. Scott, you remember people were talking about he should change positions. You know, there was so much doubt and stuff surrounding him. And this is, what, his third year of being a full-time starter and yeah. has already led that team to the Super Bowl. I do believe if he had did not get hurt towards the end of the regular season, I think that would have been him up there at the NFL Honors winning um, MVP. But, you know, what are your thoughts about the Philadelphia Eagles, especially considering, you know, there is a Houstonian that's going to be representing H-Town on the field in Arizona. Yeah, and I, I want to make the point about Jalen Hurts, too. Like, as, as impressive of a kid as you'll find, Jalen Hurts. And look, man. This is somebody that's been kind of proven doubters wrong going all the way back to college, right? Like mm-hmm. he was replaced by Tua at Alabama. At the highest Oklahoma. stage, too. At the Not just stage. a regular game, at the highest stage. But also handled that with a level of like professionalism and humility and, and showed like this leadership quality that was really special and something that you had been hearing about. Folks have been hearing about Jalen Hurts all along. You know, being somebody that's a you know a coach's son and all of that, but to the point about doubters in the NFL, it is interesting that like like this is this is not a an indictment on his doubt. I was somebody even that doubted, you know, because I did I just wasn't seeing it very early on. But this isn't as much an, of an indictment on his doubters as much as it is just a straight up credit to Jalen Hurts himself because the guy improved like. When he when they first threw him out there as a starter, his accuracy and and the just w- the way it looked very early on was not good. Like it wasn't like, man, haters is just out there hating. It just wasn't it wasn't very good. And to his credit, it has gotten better and better and better and not marginally better, drastically better. And I think that's that just you know goes to show and is a credit to his character and leadership and, and the type of work ethic that he has. Is that he's somebody that's gonna go in and play with the play within himself and work around his weaknesses, and then when it's time, gonna work on his weaknesses and try to turn those into strengths, or at least try to strengthen them. So you talk about his deep ball accuracy, the way it was this season in 2022 in the 2022 season, compared to what it was when he first, you know, got out there. I, I know he threw the deep ball just fine at Oklahoma, and mm-hmm. and. And, you know, in, in uh, Lincoln Riley's offense and when 
when he had C.D. Lamb and when guys was uh, was open. But when he got to the NFL, it did not look great. It just did not. And again, credit to him to just improving, keeping his head down and sort of having that that even kill disposition that he's always really had. So, like, I'm, I'm really impressed by Jalen Hurts. Always, always really have been from that standpoint, the intangible standpoint. But again, the improvement that he's made to his actual game is something that I think deserves a lot of credit. Now, the the strength of his game, of, of being an element in the run game and being somebody that they can rely on in short yardage situations, that push play that they do where they just push him over the line of scrimmage whenever they got a short yardage situation, mm-hmm. that's a credit to just how they play bully ball. The Philadelphia Eagles up front are no joke. They got about well at least two Hall of Famers on the offensive line, and then Jalen Hurts himself has been a power lifter since he was a child. Like the guy can squat a gajillion pounds and, our, and people, you know, people are starting to understand and realize that now, but he embodies what that team is. And that's just a bunch of dudes that are clearly like <laughs> seriously in the weight room and like strong as hell. You know, that's what's going to be, that's what's going to be Philly's advantage, right? The way I look at this game, Cody, this Super Bowl is the chiefs got, a potential go to quarterback, the best quarterback in the league in Patrick Mahomes. They got the best coach in Andy Reid, and they got the best individual offensive weapon of, of either of the teams and Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. And, and so in that regard, you're thinking advantage Chiefs. They got the best at some very key parts of the field, arguably the most key. But then in the trenches, as they say, hmm. is Philadelphia. Philadelphia's defensive line against the the Chiefs offensive line advantage Philadelphia Philadelphia's offensive line versus the Chiefs defensive line advantage uh, Philadelphia you know and so if it if it becomes that type of game where it's about which man is moving the other man off of his spot like moving another man against his will you feel like that's advantage Philadelphia so I'm very interested to see how this game is going to be played and what the style of game, uh, style of play is going to be exactly because in a lot of ways, these teams couldn't be, you know, much different or more different in terms of where the advantages are and where the matchups are. So mm. I'm real interested to see how this thing plays out. I'm picking the Chiefs. I'm picking the Chiefs. But honestly, in my heart, I'm rooting for the Ace Town kid and, and also kind of thinking in the back of my head, like, what what if this turns into a bull, into bully ball? <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I like the Eagles in a matchup like that. Yeah, man. Um, I have the same thoughts, but it's opposite. I'm rooting for Philly because I definitely want to see Jalen Hurts win. Um, but at the same time, man, I love greatness. I love talking goats. And I think if Patrick Mahomes win this one, two MVPs, two Super Bowl titles, um, I think the next, what, 10 years of his GOAT resume just going to be fun to analyze and debate. Um, yeah. Also, for fun, I think Rihanna, in her return, is going to give us a top five Super Bowl halftime performance. I'm calling it right now. It's been a long time. I know my girl going to tear up the stage. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited to see Rihanna back out there on that stage. <laughs> yeah, man. You ain't got to sell me on Rihanna. I tell you that. You ain't got to sell me on Rihanna. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm very excited to see that. I'm always mm-hmm. interested in Super Bowl halftime, Super Bowl commercials, and how all of that plays out. Mm-hmm. But Rihanna specifically, you know, this is our first look at her post motherhood. You know, yeah, or as, know. as as a mother, know. you know, things have changed, life has changed, and you know, we're all getting older. You know, and Rihanna is somebody that is uh, you know of our generation and somebody that we follow basically because you know she was a a star so early on you know as a Mm -hmm. teenager basically so she's been around basically as long as we've been around you know like (laughs) you know like it it, you know you you think back kind of like uh the when i think about sierra russell wilson's wife you know i'm like man these are people that have just been around it feels like like they're not even old yet like they're not even 40 but they've been around for it seems like forever now mm. like i said for as long as we've been around so rihanna is one of those people that i root for a little bit different than beyonce in the sense that like beyonce is the a little bit older so she's like the next generation that like a little bit ahead mm. whereas rihanna's like right there like man 
you know, like we could have went to like in my mind, we could have went to school together. You know? <laughs> exactly. So it's like it's, it's like man, Rihanna is. I'm, I'm rooting for that. Uh, real happy to see how like her life is changing in ways uh, that people's lives change around this age. Um, but also, uh, I, I love what she said was you know trying to fit a catalog of 16, 17 years, however long it's been since she's been at it, man, into a 13 minute set or however long the set is gonna be. Like they said that that, that she had like. 29 different uh dummy scripts for a set like 29 different possibilities for a set that she could have run for the super bowl so how they narrow it narrowed it down into the one that, that we're going to actually see I, I would love to know and love to see some behind the scenes of that but more than anything just interested in seeing what that product gonna look like so mm. i'm very very much and as somebody that has adored rihanna for again basically as long as i've been old enough to adore something like that <laughs> uh, uh, I'm here for it, man. You and I'm, me both, man. I'm here for it, here for it 100%. Oh, man. Brandon K. Scott from Source Radio 16. Brandon, really quick, please tell our listeners where they can follow you at on social media and be sure to plug all of your spot, all of your podcasts, especially the one with you and Adam Sport Lane with y'all basketball Houston Rockets podcast going on. That's another franchise. It's like, man, I hope they get it together really, really soon, too. Yeah, man, it's content galore. Follow me at Brandon K. Scott on Twitter at B. Scott from Hiram Clark on Instagram. And, of course, the podcast that Cody's referring to, that's the H-Town Hoops podcast with Adam Spillane. We're doing that with Odyssey, breaking down Rockets moves. One of our, I would say, our most recent episode is the one, of course, reacting to the trade deadline with Eric Gordon being moved and just looking ahead to what this team is going to look like uh, with that. And, of course, every week also the B-Block podcast, you can find that anywhere either one of those podcasts anywhere you get your podcast and yeah man of course sports radio 610 sports radio 610.com we in there uh make mm. sure you make sure you you tap in and as always i'm your host cody m davis please remember to follow me on twitter at cody davis underscore 24 once again that's cody c-o-t-y-d-a-v-i-s underscore 24 and be sure to follow my co-host john hickman John underscore Hickman 12. Subscribe to the podcast on all your favorite podcast streaming services. And of course, subscribe on YouTube. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.